David Vitali, thanks so much for joining us on the Drinks Adventures podcast. Thanks so much, James. It's good to see you again. When we caught up last time, I was kind of talking about the state of the Australian whiskey industry and how, you know, there was sort of pressure on some of the smaller players to to be competitive from a price standpoint. And that was before Twofold had even arrived. Your blended whiskey, a game changer really for Australian whiskey generally, and I would assume Starwood. How has Twofold gone over those last three or four years? Oh, it's gone amazingly well. It's it's now our number one whiskey and um, Australia's number one Australian whiskey. And I know it's a small pool given given the scale of the industry, but like, um, you know, we, we've gone from strength to strength off the back of people's interest in in twofold. And, and I think that, you know, that idea of something you can have in the sharing cabinet and proudly say, hey, this is an Australian alternative to, to what you might be drinking is sort of it's been well received. It's been overwhelmingly well received, and and like uh, it's something that you know, as a founder, you kind of put an idea out there. You don't know whether it's going to work. You blindly kind of believe it will, but you don't know. Um, and so to kind of have the support of uh, Australian drinkers and trade, for that matter, um, behind Twofold's been fantastic. And you were just about to set off to the US, almost I think, uh, at that stage as well. How the last few years in America been? Well, uh, <laughs> there's a COVID factor there, which it's not been the time you would have expected it would have been over there. <laughs> no, but, you know, in a, in a weird kind of way, like you, you go into like these sorts of new adventures, understanding that whatever you've got on the page is not likely to occur, you know, that <laughs> you have to anticipate that, you know, that the only truth of a plan is that it is incorrect. You know what I mean? Like that's the... Um, you know, the reality of a plan. And and I think that, you know, having spent, wow, what was it? By the time by the time we left, six years building the brand in the United States, uh, in, in Australia, that like I'd kind of, I felt like I'd seen everything, you know, during that period of time. I didn't quite anticipate a pandemic, you know, um, coming down our way. But look, the great thing is, um, you know, we, we have a resilient, business. Before I left, we were almost doubling every year and, and have continued to do so since then. So um, it's tapering off now, off off the back of a bumper year last year. But, you know, I think that, you know, in a weird way, the pandemic at home was a good thing for us in terms of providing people the opportunity to discover more locally produced products. And that gave us some, you know, we could make wiser decisions when it came to the United States for the longer term because we had that foundation in Australia. So, yeah, it's a really long-winded way of saying that, like, I, you know, I thought I'd seen everything, but no one kind of anticipated a, a, uh, a pandemic. And, you know, we had to act quickly like everybody did to sort of focus our business on areas where we weren't as sensitive to on-premise shutdowns and restaurants kind of closing down. Even today, we get a, a bit of an update every every quarter. And the last one that came through in January for the end of December sort of indicated that 30% of New York restaurants and bars were closed and probably won't open again. In uh, March of 2020, about 55% of our business was on-premise restaurants and bars. So to have that switched off overnight and then sort of figure out what we're going to do next was, um, you know, there was some fast thinking thinking that needed to happen. And I think um, by the end of 2020, we'd hosted 6,000 people in masterclasses um, over those um, 50 weeks. So it's about 300 a week. So it was pretty intense um, going all around. And what we would do is send out 50 ml bottle samples of um, our core range, you know, twofold Nova and Solera and get people really excited about the storytelling aspect, um, but also the, the liquid itself. So, yeah. Hopefully your job's been made a bit more easy as a result of the incredible results at the San Francisco Spirits Competition in recent weeks. Has any other distillery ever picked up that many double golds and gold medals in one go? And maybe you can inform my listeners as to what the achievement was. Yeah, so um, we won 12 double gold medals and three gold medals at the San Francisco um, World Spirits Competition, which is effectively the Olympics of spirits. Um and so not only do you have the territory categories, but different different spirit categories as well. So we cleaned up in whiskey, but we also cleaned up as a distillery. 
winning the most amount of double gold medals. And, you know, the distinction of double gold basically means that each of the judging panel members have awarded the spirit in front of them a gold medal. And usually there's at least six or seven panel members. We don't exactly know, but it's a deep bench. And to my knowledge, no one's picked up as many awards in one season, in one year as, as Starwood has this year. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, we find out whether we're distillery of the year um, in June. So I'm kind of holding my breath for that. But, you know, um, I've been around too long, James, to know uh, not to kind of count those chickens before they've hatched. <laughs> and so, you know, notwithstanding we've won the most amount of awards, um, we don't know the the action. I think that that's only part of the part of the um, assessment process. So we'll see what happens. But we're in we're in good shape. You know, we're in good shape to pick up Distillery of the Year, which is amazing. Has that already had any impact on you know inquiries from new accounts and the like? Yeah, we've had a big big bump in in sales this month. Um, that's just passed. And I think it's going to continue and new inquiries from different markets as well. On the ground, we're present in 15 different markets in the United States, but we can ship to 40 different markets. And my sense is that the gap between where we can ship and where we'll have feet on the street is going to narrow very quickly off the back of these awards. Now, what do you attribute this incredible result to? Is this just long overdue recognition or is it the case of there's been some kind of fine tuning going on with the whiskies over time? Yeah, I think that's a little bit of both. And I should point out the whiskey that we're drinking now is all from our Port Melbourne site, which we just commissioned last time we spoke. And at that point in time, we were going from three runs a day, producing roughly 400 litres of spirit, to three runs a day, producing roughly 2,000 litres of spirit. So it was a big step up. We are able to achieve these results um, with new kit that... Um, I wouldn't say has improved the spirit, but just maintaining the quality that we had beforehand is an amazing feat. It's not just a matter of saying, okay, we'll just add more barley, more water, more yeast to the fermenters and she'll be right, or just get a bigger still and it'll be the same spirit. And importantly, finding the same grade of barrels that we were using to age the whiskey, all of those things that you can't take for granted. Um, right from the starting point, you know, I mean, malted barley, we're very small. We're probably the biggest, actually, more recently, we're probably the biggest microbrewery in Victoria that doesn't sell beer, just in terms of sheer volume of whiskey wash that we make, the beer that we then distill. But we're still insignificant in the, in the scale of malted barley production in Australia. So that was a relatively straightforward scale up. But everything else, you know, we needed to kind of be very mindful of. And then through that scale up, We've also grown up as a brand and understand what works and doesn't work. So a lot of our quality processes, which barrels we say yes to, as well as the ones that we say no to, all of that sort of stuff adds depth to the inventory that means that, you know, when we win awards like this, we can keep shipping the same product month in, month out, which is pretty exciting. So it's a little bit of long overdue recognition and a little bit of like just that, you know, rolling stone of remaining curious about how we can continually improve the product. So it's not sort of like there's some, you know, age stocks that are kind of coming through and influencing the, the end product? Still three Melbourne years, anywhere yeah. between three and four. But, you know, beyond four, you know, frankly, I think personally they get a little long in the tooth. Unless um, you were using refill casts or whatever it was, correct. which, which yeah, is not exactly. something that you tend to do. We're doing a little bit of refill, but they're more mostly for single barrels and like at the margins of like just pr providing some more depth and complexion for the blenders to, to be in the pocket. So, um, but it's not, it's not older inventory that's kind of delivering this result. It's just, you know, the same old Starwood. I mean, we won a double gold for Nova in 2015 and the formulations and the spirit, all of that sort of stuff is, is fundamentally the same. We're not about putting an age statement on our whiskey. We're not about trying to deliberately go down a path of scarcity or finding the most prized barrels to put into like limited stock. All of the whiskey that we make is, you know, they're all my kids, mate, so I love them equally. Now, I believe one of the whiskies that picked up a double gold was uh, ginger beer cask. Potentially not a whole panel of judges are going to love something like that. So very pleasing to see that get that sort of approval as well. 
It sure is. And look, I think one of the things that we always pride ourselves on is like flavor first. That's always kind of at the back of our mind in terms of when we, when we turn up. And one of the proud things that I think we share as Australian whiskey distillers particularly is that innovation's kind of baked into our legislation. You know, the definition of whiskey is so broad, you can shoot a cannon through the through it, right? Like, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's it's easy to kind of craft something and still call it a whiskey, but st- but equally be innovative. And one of the things that we got really excited by, I guess, is the fact that people loved Starwood's um, curious nature, the, the idea of like what happens when or what if we did this and nothing kind of exemplifies that more than the ginger beer cask whiskey, which every year just gets better and better. I sound like a, a salesman when I say that, <laughs> but it's the truth, right? You know, I'm really looking forward to the next one that's coming out. I had, a, I was fortunate enough to have a sample of it when I was last in Melbourne, and it's not going to disappoint, that's for sure. Has it been difficult not being able to be as close to production over the last few years? Are you getting, you know, tasting samples sent over to you on the reg? The short answer to the last question is no, I don't, because, I mean, I, you know, like trust the team implicitly, and if 12 double gold medals and three gold medals <laughs> don't give you any indication of why, then then nothing will. Like, they they are um, the best in the game. And now that you've so gotten out of their hair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's probably why we won is, like, yeah. I'm not there. I mean, look, the <laughs> only thing I do better than them is mop the floors cleaner. Yeah. Like, that's my personal view. But in every other way, I've done all of their jobs, but in every other way, they're infinitely better than I am. Um, and, you know, um, how lucky am I to have that ability of sleeping well at night thousands of miles away, knowing that, you know, the whiskey that's got my name on it is being made to a level that, you know, anyone in the world would be proud to call their own. So it's pretty, I'm pretty lucky from that perspective, James. And and I think the other point coming back to have I missed it, I didn't quite appreciate how much I missed it until I went back. So I was away for 800 days and then um, came back in uh, February of this year to renew my visa to work in the United States and being there, just the aromas and just being in amongst my people. Um, was amazing obviously catching up with family and friends of course but just being at the distillery was a really poignant moment and having all of those amazing people you know we've grown we've doubled doubled the size of the the team in that time as well um through through those three years that I've been away so having the ability to to kind of come back and meet people for the first time face to face and embrace old friends and um team members that have been there you know for a very very long time since since uh the old Essendon Fields days was um, pretty special. Well, let's talk some more about Ginger Beer Cast because that's the release that we're on the eve of uh, right now. Take us back to, to the beginning, you know, for people who don't know the story of, of Ginger Beer Cask, how did it come about originally? I mean, we launched in 2013. So that's when the original Starwood was launched. And, and by 2014, we were starting to, like, um, think about ageing whiskey in red wine barrels. That was kind of the first sort of, you know, tinker. Looking at ginger beer, it was really just this idea of like, what would it take for us to make a ginger beer that would be perfectly paired to Starwood? Because this is before the mixer craze. It was before any of that sort of, um, you know, more premium sort of uh, uh, mixer like Fever Tree or Cappy uh, was in the marketplace in, in a mainstream way. And so, um if you ask a brewer to make a beer, guess what? It's going to be alcoholic. So they made an alcoholic ginger beer and we fermented that ginger beer um, and seasoned it in um, one of our old um, Apera barrels, the 50-litre Apera barrel, um, just to see what would happen. And, of course, it was alcoholic to start off with, but then once you've kind of put it into a barrel, it's going to extract all of that extra whiskey that's inside the barrel. So we ended up with like a a ginger beer that was like 11.5% ABV. I give you the tip, one of those in the afternoon and you'd need a nap before uh, before going home. And so so we, we had this ginger beer, but then it was like, well, what are we going to do with the barrel now that we've we've uh, seasoned it with all of this ginger beer and, and fermented it in that barrel? And um, Hugh Holds, who was one of the original distillers at the distillery, sort of said, well, why don't we get some of the Solera and, and uh, Solera vat and, and put some of the whiskey back in there and, see what happens. And and that's exactly what we did. It was purely an experiment in a 50-litre cask. I think we 
you know, maybe got 60 or maybe it could have been 80 odd bottles out of that first release. That was how the whiskey began. And it was really, you know, with our um, friends at um, Whiskey and Ailment and other great on-premise um, accounts in Sydney, like Baxter Inn and like working with Baron Owls and the Oak Barrel that everybody would like, this is amazing. <laughs> when are you making it again? And it's like, <laughs> boy, that was a lot of work because, you know, to make the ginger beer, we started from scratch. We're talking raw ginger from La Mana, our, um, you know, huge Bunning-sized Italian supermarket next to the distillery in, in Essendon Fields. Um, so we got a box of ginger and basically macerated it all from scratch. So the team kind of then started to to um, evolve and scale up the production. And I think up until last year, statistically, you had more chance of getting into Harvard than you did one of those barrels based on the ballot. Um, <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd have so many people kind of apply and so few, you know, so few bottles available. But we've been able to kind of step things up quite substantially as we've you know, got more space and more inventory, more barrels to actually season, um, season the the um, ginger in. So that's kind of pretty exciting. So this year, we're, we're it's going to be an exciting release because we can really step things up. The recipe's kind of evolved over time. Has it been the quest for ginger beer cast perfection, or is it just having some fun with it each year and just trying to make it subtly different? I think early on we kind of had this false idea that we could perfect the ginger beer cask finished whiskey. And the reality is that it's almost impossible to do because we're dealing with different barrels. We've taken all different types of ginger for a walk in terms of powdered ginger, working with a brewery for their ginger beer, you know, making our own macerated, all the things. And so really I think it's just an exploration of what we can do with ginger beer. And I think almost by accident, the, the odd numbers have been quite intense and poke you in the eyes and the evens have been a little bit more moderate and it's almost like we kind of overshoot it and then go, oh, let's bring it back a little. But every time we, we bring it back, we want a little bit more the next time round. So this one's going to be pretty exciting and, and you can probably guess given it's number seven which way it's going. Do you find that the ginger character in the whiskey is, is sort of stable over time? Are you able to kind of taste these years after the fact and see how they look in comparison? Yeah, look, I mean, this is the thing of, you know, when we're talking about spirits in general, it's a great way to suspend flavour. Have they evolved? Absolutely. More often than not because the bottle's been opened. Yeah, you know, and yeah. There's oxidation. They're still true to form. You know, like it's not like if you had a ginger beer cask number three now, that you'd be going, oh, wow, geez, this has really lost its kind of impact relative to a ginger beer cast number two that was of the same age, you know. And what can you tell us about this year's recipe? It's all American oak red wine barrels, which is a different sort of approach. Last year's was the first mixture of uh, red wine into the formulation. And before that, it was almost exclusively a pair of casks. So this year's all American oak red wine barrels. Australian red wine sell it in American oak barrels are the most generous barrels you'll ever get, you know, in terms of like their generosity in terms of flavour. Our French oak barrels are delicious and I have a bias towards them just from my palate perspective, but they're far more nuanced, the grain's tighter and, um, you know, you get a lot of those baking spices coming through. But but with, with American oak, it, you know, does what the box says, you know, in terms of just delivering all of that um, vanilla and, and caramel characteristic, particularly when we're using our um, charred barrels. So, you know, if you think about that in the context of ginger, it's just a perfect foil for it. Um, and uh, then, you know, the addition of that, you know, you know, the swing towards red wine casks as opposed to apera casks has added a new dimension, I think, to the whole release because all of our apera casks have been shaved, toasted and recharred before we, before we fill them. So all of a sudden we're, we're accessing that toasted oak character as opposed to that charred oak character, which is almost exclusively the, the domain of Apera, which we use to make our Solera vat. You know, I think that that dimension has been really a lot of fun to explore and gives us, you know, another six versions of ginger beer to really take for a walk over the years. And that is, I think, my instruction to the team coming back is like, now we're starting to think about number eight, you know, because it does take quite some time to season the barrels and then finish the whiskey in those seasoned barrels. 
let's continue to kind of really push the boundaries of what this whiskey can be. And tell me about like the appetite for ginger beer cask. It's been massively popular in Australia and I gather that you continue to sort of make more of it each year. Yeah, so we want to kind of continue to like really connect with that curious whiskey drinker that's sort of open-minded about whiskey generally, right? Spelt both ways. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that for the longest of times, that's been, you know, our loyal Starwood fans that have kind of come from that single malt background. But, you know, more recently, I think people are just getting really excited by this crazy idea of a whiskey infused with ginger beer. And, you know, as much as it's familiar to me, we've been doing this for seven years and, you know, to our loyal Starwood fans, there's, there's thousands upon thousands of even twofold drinkers, let alone people that have never heard of Starwood before, that we want to really introduce this whiskey to and get them um, excited by it. And, um, you know, notwithstanding that there are others out there starting to do this as well, you know, the wonderful thing that we have on our side is the scale and depth of inventory now and confidence, I guess, because we've been doing it for a while, to really, you know, go full tilt and, and start making some substantial quantities of um, of ginger beer to to have available to anybody that's curious about it. In fact, it's coming over here as well to the to the US, which is pretty exciting. Um, the land of fireball and, and honey whiskey kind of um, taking on an Aussie take with it. And I'll give you the tip, neither of those have got double gold medals on them. So it's going to be pretty exciting to, to um, you know, elbow out some space in that section of the whiskey aisle and sort of put an Aussie whiskey there and show some Americans how to make Great flavoured whiskey. I kind of think of Australia as being a nation of ginger beer lovers, and I'm not sure if that's just my own bias, you know, coming into play because I've always enjoyed a Bundaberg ginger beer. Is ginger beer something that has currency over in the States? It sure does. And in fact, Bundaberg's over here as well. So they're, yeah. they're really starting to make great strides into the US market. But beyond that, ginger beer is quite in abundance. So the idea of a ginger beer cask finished whiskey is instantly something people are curious and there's this notion of like i want to try that that sounds amazing and so given that the idea sounds amazing and now we can put this lovely gold medal on the bottle like to kind of give it that sort of um uh, credibility for something that's new and unheard of is is a huge opportunity how have you managed to scale that product up over time because you talked about how challenging it was when you started there must have must have had to be a lot of production fine-tuning that's happened since then. I think they'd say nightmares, James. Production <laughs> nightmares is probably more the way they, yeah. they relay it. You know, for me, there's no point create, creating a product where we have literally tens of thousands of people enter a ballot for four or 500 bottles only to make all of those tens of thousands of people disappointed. So, you know, the, we, there came an inflection point where it was like, okay, well, we need to do something about this. Either we're going to kind of keep it as a distillery only, get it if you come as a reward to the distillery, which didn't feel right to me, um, or we're going to scale this up to a level at which we can make it work. And, you know, very quickly we moved from, you know, Breville blenders and wooden spoons to kind of doing this at scale um, in a way that meant that the production team weren't spending literally months just on ginger beer cask when there were other things that they were curious to explore as well, right? So alongside that migration from Essendon Fields to Port Melbourne, you know, we gave the team a little bit more latitude and space physically and mentally to kind of explore these innovative tracks a little more and invested in the infrastructure to support that. And so things like ginger beer cask, our bottle cocktails, are all a result of that sort of space given to the production team to play. Is the Port Melbourne site able to accommodate all of your ambitions that you have in the coming years? The challenge is not actually production, as much as they'll kind of fall over their chairs when they hear that. Um, of course, it's a challenge, but, you know, I think we've kind of managed, we understand what it takes to scale up the production environment and actually the footprint that we need to do that can fit well within the one acre of site that we've got under roof in Port Melbourne. It's quite, quite a big space. The challenge is not there. The challenge is in the three other acres of, you know, whiskey under bond that we have. The more you scale, the more space you need from that perspective. 
So by the end of, I think it's this year, we'll have four acres of whiskey under, you know, about three and a half acres if you take out the production space and hospitality space of whiskey maturing under bond, six or seven levels high of, of whiskey. Um, so it's pretty exciting. But that's the challenge is then sort of scaling that bit up. Is there maybe an off-site bond store in your future? We've got a few already and we'll, we'll add some more. Yeah. Yeah, right. Now, before I let you go, there's been, you know, some incredible news around in the last 12 months just with some of the new players that are entering the market in Australia. Um, you know, obviously we've seen the likes of Casella come in with Morris, uh, Coopers in recent weeks announcing that they're getting into whiskey, Ostra Distillers from Victoria buying West End's brew house, and there's several others I could mention, and I certainly haven't seen you know, in the last decade or so that I've sort of been watching the Australian whiskey space, this many new bigger players coming in. What do you think that means for Australian whiskey? Is this a positive thing to see? It's wholeheartedly positive. Like I am the biggest proponent of, you know, getting uh, more investment in the industry. You know, I mean, um, Top Shelf with Ned's another example. Of course, yeah. yeah. And it's so exciting to see investment at substantial scale from day one as opposed to the nickeling and diming that we all had to do and have had to do pretty much I guess until well, let's you know let's face it probably Casella coming along you know with with um, Morris they kind of probably you know they started with a very clear intention in mind but everybody before that has started with you know uh, a, a still that remark looks remarkably like the still that Bill started off with you know um years ago or something that, you know, of that sort of um, scale. So, you know, it's exciting for me to sort of see this happen. I'm, you know, like I'm on the record and I'll say it again, you know, I'd take the keys to any Australian distiller, whiskey distillery, such as the quality that's being made. The only challenge is scale. And I think that that quote's going to become very, very quickly redundant, you know, like which is pretty exciting because it gives us the ability to have an Australian section, um, not just in our local retail um, network in Australia, like in the likes of a Dan Murphy's or, you know, Vinci Sellers or, um, you know, First Choice and BWS, but have an Australian section around the world and how wonderful would that be? David, thanks so much for joining us on the Drinks Adventures podcast and congratulations again on some of those recent accolades. Thanks, mate. And let's keep it short.